Well, folks, we've got a pretty big schedule planned for today. We've got a reading series, exercise series, write, Hearthstone, and Fallout 76. So, five total. Alright, let's get to it. Alright, let's start in chapter 13. War and Peace, book 3. That same night, Rostov was with a platoon on skirmishing duty in front of the Gratian's detachment. His hussars were placed along the line in couples, and he himself rode along the line trying to master the sleepless, uh, the sleepiness that kept coming over him. An enormous space, with our army's campfires dimly glowing in the fog, could be seen behind him. In front of him was misty darkness. Rostov could see nothing, peer as he would into that foggy distance. Now something gleamed gray. Now there was something black. Now little lights seemed to glimmer where the enemy ought to be. Now he fancied it was only something in his own eyes. His eyes kept clo closing, and in his fancy appeared. Now the Emperor, now Denisov, and now Moscow memories. And he again hurriedly opened his eyes and saw close before him the head and ears of the horse he was riding. Sometimes... When he came within faces of them, the black figures of hussars, but in the distance was still the same misty darkness. Why not? It might easily happen, thought Rostov, that the emperor will meet me and give me an order as he would to any other officer, I'll say. Go and find out what's there. There are many stories of his getting to know an officer just a chance, just such a chance way in attaching him to himself. What if he gave me a place near him? Oh, how I would guard him, how I would tell him the truth. I would unmask his deceivers. In order to re realize vividly his love devotion to the sovereign, Rostov pictured to himself an enemy or a deceitful German, whom he would not only kill with pleasure, but whom he would slap in the face before the emperor. Suddenly a distant shout roused him. He started and opened his eyes. Where am I? Oh yes, in the skirmishing line. Pass and watchword, shaft, all months. What a nuisance that our squadron will be in reserve tomorrow, he thought. I'll ask leave to go to the front. This may be my only chance of seeing the Emperor. It won't be long now before I'm off duty. I'll take another turn, and when I get back, I'll go to the general and ask him. He readjusted himself in the saddle and touched up his horse to ride once more around his hussars seemed to him that it was getting lighter. To the left he saw a sloping descent lit up, and facing it a black knoll that seemed as steep as a wall. On this knoll there was a white patch that Rostov could not at all make out. Was it a glade in the wood lit up by the moon, or some unmelted snow, or some white houses? He even thought something moved on that white, sm that white spot. I expected snow. That spot. The spot in touch, he thought. There, there now, it's not a touch. Natasha, sister, black eyes. Natasha. Won't you be surprised when I tell her how I've seen the Emperor? Natasha, take my saber, Tash. Keep to the right, Your Honor. There are bushes here, in the voice of an hussar, past whom Rostov was writing in the act of falling asleep. Rostov lifted his head, that had sunk almost to his horse's mane, and pulled up beside the hussar. He was succumbing to irresistible, youthful, childish drowsiness. But what was I thinking? I mustn't forget. How shall I speak to the emperor? I don't think it's childishness, Leo, because you never lose the need to sleep. And no matter what age that you are, you always need sleep. But what was I thinking? I mustn't forget. How shall I speak to the Emperor? No, that's not it. That's tomorrow. Oh, yes. Natasha, Saber Tash. Saber them whom? The Hussars. Ah, the Hussars with mustaches. Along the Tsvertskaya Street rode the Hussar with mustaches. I thought about him too, just opposite Guryev's house. Old Guryev. Oh, but Denisov's a fine fellow. But that's all nonsense. The chief thing is that the Emperor's here. 
how he looked at me and wished to say something but dared not. No, it was I who dared not. But that's nonsense. The chief thing is not to forget the important thing I was thinking of. Yes, Natasha, Sabertash. Oh yes, yes, that's right. And his head once more sank to his horse's neck. All at once it seemed to him that he was being fired at. What? 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 Cut them down. What? Said Rostov, waking up. The moment he opened his eyes, he heard in front of him, where the enemy was, the long-drawn shouts of thousands of voices. His horse and the horse of the hussar near him pricked their ears at these shouts. Over there, where the shouting came from, a flare fired up and went out again. Then another, and all along the French line on the hill, fires flared up, and the shouting grew louder and louder. Rostov could hear the sound of French words, but could not distinguish them. The din of many voices was too great. All he could hear was, ha uh, <laughs> ha I'm saying that right, error. What's that? What do you make of it? Said Rostov to the hussar beside him. That must be the enemy's camp. The hussar did not reply. Why, don't you hear it? Rostov asked again after waiting for a reply. Who can tell, your honor? Replied the hussar reluctantly. From the direction it must be the enemy, repeated Rostov. It may be he or it may be nothing, muttered the hussar dark. Steady, he cried to his fidgeting horse. Rostov's horse was also getting restive. It pawed the frozen ground, pricking its ears at the noise and looking at the lights. The shouting grew still louder and merged into a general roar that only an army of several thousand men could produce. The lights spread farther and farther, probably along the line of the French camp. Rostov no longer wanted to sleep. The gay triumphant shouting of the army had a stimulating effect on him. Vive l'Emperor, l'Emperor, he now heard distinctly. It can't be far off, probably just beyond the stream, he said to the hussar beside him. The hussar only sighed without replying and coughed angrily. The sound of horses heads approaching at a trot along the line of hussars was heard, and out of the foggy darkness, the figure of the sergeant of hussars suddenly appeared, looming huge as an elephant. Your Honor, the generals, said the sergeant, riding up to Rostov. Rostov, still looking around toward the fires and the shouts, rode with the sergeant to meet some mounted men who were riding along the line. One was on a white horse. Prince Bagration and Prince Dolgorukov, with their adjutants, had come to witness the curious phenomenon of the lights and shouts in the enemy's camp. Rostov rode up to Bagration, reported to him, and then joined the adjutants listening to what the generals were saying. Believe me, said Prince Dolgorukov, addressing Bagration, it's nothing but a trick. He has retreated and ordered the rear guard to kindle fires and make a noise to deceive us. Hardly, said Bagration. I saw them this evening on that knoll. If they retreated, they would have withdrawn from that too. Officer, said Bagration to Rostov, are the enemy's skirmishers still there? They were this evening, but now I don't know, Your Excellency. Shall I go with some of my hussars to see, replied Rostov. Bagration stopped, and before replying, tried to see Rostov's face in the mist. Well, go and see, he said after a pause. Yes, sir. Rostov spurred his horse, called to Sergeant Fijenko and two other hussars, told them to follow him, and trotted downhill in the direction from which the shouting came. He felt both frightened and pleased to be riding alone with three hussars into that mysterious and dangerous misty distance, where no one had been before him. Bagration called to him from the hill not to go beyond the stream, but Rostov pretended not to hear him and did not stop but rode on and on, continually mistaking bushes for trees and gillies for men, and continually discovering his mistakes. Having descended the hill at a trot, he no longer saw either our own or the enemy's fires, but heard the shouting of the French more loudly and distinctly. In the valley he saw before him something like a river, but when he reached it he found that it was a road. Having come out onto the road he reined in his horse, hesitating whether to ride along it or across it and ride over the black field up the hillside. To keep to the road which gleamed white in the mist would have been safer because it would be easier to see people coming along it. Follow me, said he, crossed the road and began riding up the hill at a gallop toward the point where the French pickets had been standing that evening. Your honor, there he is, cried one of the hussars behind him. Before Rostov had time to make out what the black thing was that had suddenly appeared in the fog, there was a flash, followed by a report, 
and a bullet whizzing high up in the mist, with a plaintive sound, passed out of hearing. Another musket missed fire, but flashed back in the pan. A uh, flashed in the pan. Rostov turned his horse and galloped back. Four more reports followed at intervals, and the bullets passed somewhere in the fog, singing in different tones. Rostov reined in his horse, whose spirits had risen like his own at the firing, and went back at a foot pace. Well, some more, some more, a merry voice was saying in his soul, but no more shots came. Only when approaching Bagration did Rostov let his horse gallop again, and with his hand at the salute, rode up to the general. Dolgurikov was still insisting that the French had retreated and had only let fires to deceive us. What does that prove, he was saying as Rostov rode up. They might retreat and leave the pickets. It's plain that they have not yet all gone, Prince, said Bagration. Wait till tomorrow morning. We'll find out everything tomorrow. The picket is still on the hill, Your Excellency, just where it was in the evening, reported Rostov, stooping forward with his hand at the salute and unable to repress the smile of delight induced by his ride, and especially by the sound of bullets. Very good, very good, said Bagration. Thank you, officer. Your Excellency, said Rostov, may I ask a favor? What is it? Tomorrow our squadron is to be in reserve. May I ask to be attached to the first squadron? What's your name? Count Rostov. Oh, very well. You may say, stay in attendance on me. Count Ilya Rostov's son, asked Elgurikov. But Rostov did not reply. Then I may reckon on it, Your Excellency? I will give the order. Tomorrow, very likely, I may be sent with some message to, to the Emperor, thought Rostov. Thank God. The fires and shouting in the enemy's army were occasioned by the fact that, while Napoleon's proclamation was being read to the troops, the Emperor himself rode round his boot backs. The soldiers on seeing him lit wisps of straw and ran after him, shouting, Vive l'Emperor! Napoleon's proclamation was as follows. Soldiers, the Russian army is advancing against you to avenge the Austrian army of Ulm. They are the same battalions you broke at Hallebrunn and have pursued ever since to this place. The position we occupy is a strong one, and while they are marching to go round beyond the right, they will expose a flank to me. Soldiers, I will myself direct your battalions. I will keep out of fire if you, with your habitual valor, carry, dis carry disorder and confusion into the enemy's ranks. And should victory be in doubt, even for a moment, you will see your emperor exposing himself to the first blows of the enemy. But there must be no doubt of victory, especially on this day when what is at stake is the honor of the French infantry, so necessary to the honor of our nation. Do not break your ranks on the plea of removing the wounded. Let every man be fully imbued with the thought that we must defeat these hirelings of England, inspired by such hatred of our nation. This victory will conclude our campaign and we can return to winter quarters, where fresh French troops who are being raised in France will join us. And the peace I shall conclude will be worthy of my people, of you, and of myself. Okay, that was Napoleon. His uh, victory, or whatever it's called, morale booster speech. And as the history books will show, he is going to win the Battle of Three Emperors, so apparently it's going to pay off. Okay, next time will be chapter 14. Alright, let's fast forward to Crime and Punishment. Chapter 3 now. Peter Petrovich, she cried, protect me, you at least. Make this foolish woman understand that she can't behave like this to a lady in misfortune, that there is a law for such things. I'll go to the governor general himself. She shall answer for it, remembering my father's hospitality to protect these orphans. Okay, as we will recall... Um, what's her name? Katerina? Yeah. Katerina Ivanovna is having, like, a dinner get-together. Following the funeral, commemorating her, her husband's passing, Marmoladov. And she was upset because a bunch of people did not show up. And of the people who did show up, her landlady is one of the people that did show, and she's 
arguing with her. Um, and that is Amelia even though I believe. Yeah, and they're just going back and forth. Uh, and we got Sonia and Raskolnikov covered there. Peter Petrovich comes in. Allow me, madam. Allow me. Peter Petrovich waved her off. Your papa, as you are well aware, I have not had the honor of knowing. I had not the honor of knowing. Someone laughed aloud. And I do not intend to take part in your everlasting squabbles with Amelia Ivanovna. I have come here to speak of my own affairs. And I want to have a word with your stepdaughter, Sophia. Ivanovna, I think it is. Allow me to pass. Peter Petrovich, edging by her, went to the opposite corner where Sonia was. Again, sometimes Theodore uses one name, uh, two names for the same person. So Sonia is Sofia Ivanovna, uh, Evdocha Romanovna is also known as Dunya, and Raskolnikov himself is Rudja Romanovna. And Peter Petrovich is, of course, also known as Lucian. I think it's like a first name, middle name, last name thing. But yeah, hard to tell. <laughs> it's like they have two family names, is what it seems like sometimes. Katerina Ivanovna remained standing where she was as though thunderstruck. She could not understand how Peter Petrovich could deny having enjoyed her father's hospitality. Though she had invented it herself, she believed in it firmly by this time. She was struck too by the business-like, dry, and even contemptuous, men menacing tone of Peter Petrovich. Seems like she doesn't really need to go to as great lengths as Raskolnikov's mom to curate her suitors. Particularly, particularly because Sonia's had to resort to walking the streets at night, basically. Okay. But Raskolnikov is still interested in her because he sees in herself kind of the, um, uh, he knows that she's had to resort to that and he knows that he also has done morally wrong things, questionable acts, but what was his double murder? So he kind of sees her as like himself. All the clamor gradually died away at his entrance. Not only was this serious businessman strikingly incongruous with the rest of the party, but it was evident, too, that he had come upon some matter of consequence, that some exceptional cause must have brought him, and then, and that therefore something was going to happen. Raskolnikov, standing beside Sonia, moved aside to let him pass. Peter Petrovich did not seem to notice him. Raskolnikov and Peter Petrovich definitely are not going to get along. Raskolnikov is the reason why. Peter Petrovich had to um, break up with his sister Dunya because they couldn't get along. So yeah, they probably still are going to have bad blood between them. All the clamor gradually died away at his entrance. Okay, let me skip ahead. I've already read that. A minute later, Lubishnikov too appeared in the doorway. He did not come in, but stood still, listening with marked interest, almost wonder, and seemed for a time perplexed. Excuse me for possibly interrupting you, but it's a matter of some importance, Peter Petrovich observed, addressing the company generally. I am glad indeed to find other persons present. Amelia Ivanovna, I humbly beg you, as a mistress of the house, to pay careful attention to what I have to, to say to Sophia Ivanovna. Sophia Ivanovna, 
he went on addressing Sonia, who was very much surprised and already alarmed. Immediately after your visit, I found that a hundred ruble note was missing from my table, in the room of my friend, Mr. Lubishnikov. Hmm. Amelia even opens the landlady. And I think that he's trying to frame Sonia. Because as I recall, he actually gave her that money at the end of the uh, first chapter of this book. And so now he's saying she stole it. I believe. Yeah, now he's saying she stole it. If in any way, whatever you know, and will tell us where it is now, I assure you on my word of honor and call all present to witness that the matter shall end there. In the opposite case, I shall be compelled to have recourse to very serious measures, and then you must blame yourself. Complete silence reigned in the room. Even the crying children were still. Sonia stood deathly pale, staring at Lucian and unable to say a word. She seemed not to understand. Some seconds passed. Well, how is it to be, then? asked Lucian, looking intently at her. I don't know. I know nothing about it, Sonia articulated faintly at last. Yeah, either he's making it up or it's the money that he gave to her. Let me see if I can backtrack a little bit. Let's see, chapter one. I'm pretty sure it was the end of chapter one. I don't think it was the end of chapter two. Um, hmm, hold on a second. It might have been chapter two. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think it was chapter two. It was towards the end of the chapter. Was it in part four that that happened? Maybe it was. Yeah, because the majority of chapter two is focused on the interactions between Katarina and Amelia. Must have been uh, part four that that happened. It m I think it was the end of part four. The last chapter, maybe. that that happened after they met though yeah I thought that he met with Dunya and okay yeah I think it was in chapter one yeah part five chapter one Peter met with Sonia. I might just have to skip ahead if I can't find it, but I'm pretty sure that they met. I just can't remember where it was in the book.
Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's chapter one. Just looking through it now. If I can't find it, I'll just skip ahead. Okay, yeah, it was chapter one. All right, yeah. Five minutes later, Lebeznikov came with Sonia. Let me skip ahead. I don't even know if that stream recorded. Sometimes when I stream this series, my just chatting series, they don't get any views, and by extension, they don't get saved. I don't know why that happens. I think it has something to do with Twitch. But yeah, if there are gaps in the story that appear on YouTube, that's why. Because some of these streams just straight up do not get saved. Pretty sure he offered her the money. Yeah, okay, here it is. Like towards the end of chapter one. And Peter Petrovich held out to Sonia a 10 ruble note carefully unfolded. She muttered something and began taking leave. Peter Petrovich accompanied her ceremoniously to the door. It's just not at the at the very end. Okay. So now he's saying she stole it. Looks like. Alright, where was I? Complete silence running the room. Even the crying children were still. I know nothing about it, she says. No, you know nothing. Lucian repeated, and again he paused for some seconds. Think a moment, mademoiselle. He began severely, but still, as it were, admonishing her. Reflect. I am prepared to give you time for consideration. Kindly observe this. If I were not so entirely convinced, I should not. You may be sure. With my experience, venture to accuse you so directly. Seeing that for such direct accusation before witness, uh, before witnesses, if false or even mistaken, I should myself, in a certain sense, be made responsible. More at that. This morning I changed for my own purposes several 5% securities for the sum of approximately 3,000 rubles. The account is noted down in my pocketbook. On my return home, I proceeded to count the money, as Mr. Lebeznikov will bear witness. After counting 2,300 rubles, I put the rest in my pocketbook and my coat pocket. About 500 rubles remain on the table, and among them, three notes of 100 rubles each. At that moment, you entered at my invitation, and all the time you were present, you were exceedingly embarrassed. So the three times you jumped up in the middle of the conversation and tried to make off. Mr. Lubezhnikov can bear witness to this. You yourself, mademoiselle, probably will not refuse to confirm my statement that I invited you through Mr. Lubezhnikov, solely in order to discuss with you the hopeless and destitute position of your relative, Katerina Ivanovna. 
whose dinner I was unable to attend, and the advisability of getting up something of the nature of a subscription, lottery of the like for her benefit. He thanked me and even shed tears. I describe all this as it took place, primarily to recall it to your mind, secondly to show you that not the slightest detail has escaped my recollection. Then I took a 10 ruble note from the table and handed it to you by way of first installment on my part for the benefit of your relative. Mr. Lebeshnikov saw all this, and then accompanied you to the door. You being still in the same state of embarrassment, after which being left alone with Mr. Lebeshnikov, I talked to him for 10 minutes. Then Mr. Lebeshnikov went out and I returned to the table with the money lying on it, intending to count it and put it aside, as I proposed doing before. To my surprise, 100 ruble note had disappeared. I only consider the position. Mr. Lubishnikov, I cannot suspect. I'm ashamed to allude to such a supposition. I cannot have made a mistake in my reckoning. For the minute before your entrance, I had finished my accounts and found the total correct. So is he saying that she took it while they were meeting? Or, yeah, I guess so. He's saying she swiped it when she was there at some point. Either he's lying or he's telling the truth, but I don't think he's telling the truth. I think he's lying. Admit that recollecting your embarrassment, your eagerness to get away, and the fact that you kept your hands for some time on the table, taking into consideration your social position and the habits associated with it, I was, so to say, with horror and positively against my will, compelled to entertain a suspicion, a cruel but justifiable suspicion. Like, <laughs> he invites her and there's, like, money all over the table. Like, that's trouble. Trouble waiting to happen. Anytime you see a bunch of money anywhere just lying out, it's yeah, it's not, not a good scene to be at. Reminds me of like that scene from the opening of Scarface, the like, uh, botch drug deal, uh, and also the other scene from um, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, yes, of course, Uncut Gems, and um. One with the cowboy guy. Um, something about the wind, right? I feel like it's pretty famous. Hang on a second. No Country for Old Men, I think it's called. Um, yeah. Okay, anyway, all right, where was I? I will add further and repeat that in spite of my positive conviction, I realize that I run a certain risk in making this accusation. But as you see, I can now let it pass. I've taken action and will tell you why. Solely, madame, solely, owing to your black ingratitude. I invite you for the benefit of your destitute relative. I present you with my donation of 10 rubles. Will you, on the spot, repay me for all that with such an action? It is too bad. You need a lesson. Reflect. Moreover, like a true friend, I beg you. You could have no better friend at this moment. Think what you're doing. Otherwise, I shall be immovable. What do you say? I have taken nothing, Sonia whispered in terror. You gave me 10 rubles. Here, it is. Take it. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's lying or trying to recuse her of it. Again, I still don't know if um, he knows that Raskolnikov has feelings for her. He might be able to come to that conclusion based on the money he gave Katerina. But, yeah, I'm not sure. It's hard for me to say what Peter knows. As far as the uh, Marmola dolls are concerned, or even known as whatever their family is known as. Let's 
Sonya pulled her handkerchief out of her pocket, tied a corner of it, took out a 10 ruble note, and gave it to Lujan. And 100 rubles you do not confess to taking, he insisted reproachfully, not taking the note. Sonya looked about her. All were looking at her with such awful, stern, ironical, hostile eyes. She looked at Raskolnikov. He stood against the wall with his arms crossed, looking at her with glowing eyes. Good God, broke from Sonya. Yeah, I feel bad for Sonya. <laughs> I felt bad for her, like, this entire story, and I feel even worse for her now. She's like one of those people that, like, bad stuff just keeps happening to her. <laughs> Amelia Ivanovna, we shall have to send word to the police, and therefore I humbly beg you, meanwhile, to send for the house porter. Lujan said softly and even kindly. God der barm her. Uh, hang on. God der barm her jig. I knew she was the thief, cried Amelia Ivanovna, throwing up her hands. Got them barm barm her jigin. Um to I think it means merciful God. <laughs> yeah, I think it's German. You knew it. Uh you knew it. Lujan caught her up. Then I suppose you had some reason for this for thinking so. I beg you, worthy Amelia Ivanovna, to remember your words which have been uttered before witnesses. There was a buzz of loud conversation on all sides. All were in movement. What? cried Kennedy Ivanovna, suddenly realizing the position, and she rushed at Lujan. What, you accuse her of stealing, Sonia? Ah, the wretches, the wretches. Running to Sonia, she flung her wasted arms round her and held her, in a, held her as in a vice. Sonia, how dare you to take ten rubles from him, foolish girl. Give it to me. Give me the ten rubles at once, here. Snatching the note from Sonia, Katerina Ivanovna crumpled it up and flung it straight into Lujan's face. It hit him in the eye and fell on the ground. Amelia Ivanovna hastened to pick it up. Peter Petrovich lost his temper. Hold that mad woman, he shouted. At that moment, several other persons besides Lebeshnikov appeared in the doorway, among them the two ladies. What, mad? Am I mad? Idiot. Shrieked Katerina Ivanovna. You're an idiot yourself. Pettifogging lawyer base man. Sonia, Sonia, take his money. Sonia, a thief. Why, she'd give away her last penny. And Katerina Ivanovna broke into hysterical laughter. Did you ever see such an idiot? She turned from side to side. And you too. She suddenly saw the landlady. And you too, sausage eater. You declare that she's a thief. You trashy Prussian hen's leg in a crinoline. Crinoline, what is that? Stiff under hoop petticoat worn to make a long skirt stand out. I think those are those things that make the dresses look big. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they are, okay. Yeah, it's one of those old fashioned things. Right, I'll be back after you use the bathroom. As always, thanks for watching. Thank you for following. If you're on YouTube, thank you for subscribing.
Okay, and we're back. Whew. She hasn't been out of this room. She came straight from you, you wretch, and sat down beside me. Uh, beside me. Everyone saw her. She sat here by Rojan Romanovich. Search her. Since she's not left the room, the money would have to be on her. Search her, search her. If you don't find it, then excuse me, my dear fellow. I'll answer for it. I'll go to our sovereign, to our sovereign. To our gracious Tsar himself and throw myself at his feet today, this minute. I'm alone in the world. Uh, I'm alone in the world. They would let me in. You think they wouldn't? You're wrong. I will get in. I will get in. You reckoned on her meekness. You relied upon that, but I am not so submissive. Let me tell you. You've gone too far yourself. Search her. Search her. Katerina Ivanovna in a frenzy shook Lujan and dragged him towards Sonia. I am ready. I'll be responsible, but calm yourself, madame. Calm yourself. I see that you are not so submissive. Well, well, but as to that, Lujan muttered, that ought to be before the police, though indeed there are witnesses enough as it is. I am ready. But in any case, it's difficult for a man on account of her sex. But with the help of Amelia Ivanovna, though of course it's not the way to do things, how is it to be done? As you will, let anyone who likes search her, cried Ev Katerina Ivanovna. Sonia, turn out your pockets. See, look, monster, the pocket is empty. Here is her handkerchief. Here is the other pocket, look. Do you see? Do you see? Katerina Ivanovna turned, or rather snatched both pockets inside out. But from the right pocket a piece of paper flew out, and describing a parabola in the air fell at Lucian's feet. Okay, wow. Yeah, so maybe she did steal it, or maybe Lucian had it planted on her. Somehow. I don't know. I don't know what actually happened, but let's see. Everyone saw it, several cried out. Peter Petrovich stooped down, picked up the paper in two fingers, lifted it where all could see it, and opened it. It was a hundred ruble note folded in ink. Peter Petrovich held up the note, showing it to everyone. Thief! Out of my lodging! Police! Police! yelled Amelia Ivanovna. They must be to Siberia be sent. Away! Exclamations arose on all sides. Raskolnikov was silent, keeping his eyes fixed on Sonia. Except for an occasional rapid glance at Lujan. Sonia stood, uh, stood still as though unconscious. She was hardly able to feel surprise. Suddenly the color rushed to her cheeks. She uttered a cry and hid her face in her hands. No, it wasn't I. I didn't take it. I know nothing about it, she cried with a heart-ending wail. She ran to Katerina Ivanovna, who clasped her tightly in her arms, as though she would be she would shelter her from all the world. Yeah, it's possible that he planted it on her somehow. Like, slid it into her pocket when she was sitting next to him or something like that. How she, how he would have done that, I don't really know. But, anything's possible, I guess. I don't remember reading about that in chapter one, but uh, it is in her pocket, so who knows. Sonia, Sonia, I don't believe it. You see, I don't believe it, she cried in the face of the obvious fact, swaying her to and fro in her arms like a baby, kissing her face continually, then snatching at her hands and kissing them too. You took it. How stupid these people are. Oh dear, you're fools, fools, she cried, addressing the whole room. You don't know. You don't know what a heart she has, what a girl she is. She'd take it, she? She'd sell her last rag. She'd go barefoot to help you if you needed it. That's what she is. She has the yellow passport because my children were starving. She sold herself for us. Ah, uh, husband, husband, do you see? Do you see? What a memorial dinner for you. Merciful heavens. Defend her. Why are you all standing still? Rojan Romanovich, why don't you stand up for her? Do you believe it too? You're not worth her little finger, all of you together. Good God, defend her now at least. Hard to say if Raskolnikov will defend her or not. He's been pretty much a guy that 
doesn't really jive with most people. Um, I think that Sonya was probably one of the only people that he had a positive interaction with. So, we'll see if he plays Hero, but he might, he may not, just because... He may just come to a rescue because it's Illusion who's accusing her. <laughs> half expecting him to duke it out with a guy just because the wail of the poor consumptive helpless woman seemed to produce a great effect on her audience the agonized wasted consumptive face the parched blood-stained lips the hoarse voice the tears unrestrained as a child's the trustful childish and yet despairing prayer for help were so piteous that everyone seemed to feel for her Peter Petrovich, at any rate, was at once moved to compassion. Well, Madame, Madame, this incident does not reflect upon you, he cried impressively. No one would take upon himself to accuse you of being an instigator, or even an accomplice in it, especially as you have proved her guilt by turning out her pockets, showing that you had no previous idea of it. I'm most ready, most ready to show compassion. It's poverty, so to speak, that drove Sofia Semyonovna to it, but... Why did you refuse to confess, mademoiselle? Were you afraid of the disgrace? The first step. You lost your head, perhaps. One can quite understand it, but how could you have lowered yourself to such an action? Gentlemen, he addressed the whole company. Gentlemen, compassionate and, so as to say, commiserating these people, I'm ready to overlook it even now in spite of the personal insult lavished upon me. May this disgrace be a lesson to you for the future, he said, addressing Sonia. I will carry the matter no further. Enough. Like, what would even be the point of calling the cops on her? I don't know. <laughs> Peter Petrovic stole a glance at Raskolnikov. Their eyes met, and the fire in Raskolnikov seemed ready to reduce him to ashes. Meanwhile, Katerina Ivanovna apparently heard nothing. She was kissing and hugging Sonya like a mad woman. The children, too, were embracing Sonya on all sides, and Polenka, though she did not fully understand what was wrong, she was drowned in tears and shaking with sobs. As she hid her pretty little face, swollen with weeping on Sonya's shoulder. How vile! A loud voice cried suddenly in the doorway. Peter Petrovich looked round quickly. What vileness! Lebeznikov repeated, staring him straight in the face. Peter Petrovich gave a positive start. All noticed it and recalled it afterwards. Lebeznikov strode into the room. And you dare to call me as a witness, he said, going up to Peter Petrovich. What do you mean? What are you talking about? muttered Lujan. I mean that you are a slanderer. That's what my words mean, Lebeznikov said hotly, looking sternly at him with his short-sighted eyes. He was extremely angry. Raskolnikov gazed intently at him, as though seizing and weighing each word. Again, there was silence. Peter Petrovich, indeed, seemed almost dumbfounded for the first moment. If you mean that for me, he began stammering. But what's the matter with you? Are you out of your mind? I'm in my mind, but you're a scoundrel. How vile. I've heard everything. I kept waiting on purpose to understand it, for I must even now, I must own even now, it is not quite logical. What you've done, it all for, I can't understand. Why, what have I done, then? Give over talking your nonsense riddles. Or maybe you're a drunk. You may be a drunkard, perhaps, about man, but I'm not. I never touch vodka, for it's against my convictions. Would you believe it? He himself, with his own hands, gave Sofia Semyonovna that 100-ruble note. I saw it. I was a witness. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Yeah, so I guess maybe he gave it to her at the same time as the $10 bill. I guess that's what happened. <sighs> hmm. I'll take my oath. He did it. He, repeated Lebeznikov, addressing all. Are you crazy, milksop? Squeal Lujan. I just love, it, love the verb choices of Fyodor. 
and people shriek, cry, squeal. <laughs> it, it adds a lot to the character of the moment. She is herself before you. She herself here declared just now before everyone that I gave her only 10 rubles. Now I'm confused. Did he give him ten did he give her ten dollars or hundred and ten dollars? How could I have given it to her? I saw it. I saw it, Ledeshnikov repeated. And though it is against my principles, I'm ready this very minute to take any oath you like before the court, for I saw how you slipped it in her pocket. Unlike a fool, I thought you did it out of kindness. Maybe as she turned to go. Like, as he followed her out, he slipped it in her pocket, maybe. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. When you were saying goodbye to her at the door while you held her hand in one hand with the other, the left, you slipped the note into her pocket. I saw it. I saw it. Rujin turned pale. Yeah, so I guess that would explain it. What lies? He cried impudently. Why, how could you, standing by the window, see the note? You fancied it with your short-sighted eyes. You're raving. No, I didn't fancy it, and though I was standing some way off, I saw it all. Though it certainly would be hard to distinguish a note from the window, that's true. I knew for certain that it was a hundred ruble note, because when you were going to give Sophia Semyonovna ten rubles, you took up from the table a hundred ruble note. I saw it because I was standing near then, and an idea struck me at once, so that I did not forget you had it in your hand. You folded it and kept it in your hand all the time. I didn't think of it again until when you were getting up. You changed it from your right hand to your left hand and nearly dropped it. I noticed it because the same idea struck me again. That you meant to do her kindness without my seeing. You can fancy how I watched you and I saw how you succeeded in slipping it into her pocket. I saw it. I saw it. I'll take my oath. The Bezhnikov was almost breathless. Exclamations arose on all hands, chiefly expressive of wonder. But some were menacing in tone. They all crowded around Peter Petrovich, uh, Peter Petrovich. Katerina Ivanovna flew to Lebeznikov. I was mistaken in you. Protect her. You're the only one to take her part. She's an orphan. God has sent you. Katerina Ivanovna, hardly knowing what she was doing, sank on her knees before him. A pack of nonsense, yelled Lujin, roused to fury. It's all nonsense. You've been talking. An idea struck you you didn't think. You noticed. What does it amount to? So I gave it to her on the sly on purpose? What for? With what object? What have I to do with this? What for? That's what I can't understand. But that's what I'm telling you is a fact. That's certain. Yeah, I'm also not entirely sure why Peter would do this. So far from my being mistaken, the infamous criminal man, I remember how, on account of it, a question occurred to me at once, just when I was thanking and pressing your hand. What made you put it secretly in her pocket? Why did it, why you did it secretly, I mean? Could it be simply to conceal it from me, knowing that my convictions are opposed to yours, and that I do not approve of private benevolence, which affects no radical cure? Well, I decided that you really were ashamed of giving such a large sum before me. Perhaps, too, I thought, he wants to give her a surprise, and she finds a whole hundred ruble note in her pocket. For I know some benevolent people are very fond of decking out their charitable actions in that way. Then the idea struck me, too, that you wanted to test her to see whether, when she found it, she would come to thank you. Then, too, that you wanted to avoid thanks, and that, as the saying is, your right hand should not know. Something of that sort, in fact. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing, the expression. I thought of so many possibilities that I put off considering it, but still thought it indelicate to show you that I knew your secret. Yeah, in this case, both of his hands know what they're doing. No. I thought of so many possibilities that I put off considering it, but still thought it indelicate to show that I knew your secret. But another idea to uh, struck me again that Sofia Semyonovna might easily lose the money before she noticed it. 
That's why I decided to come in here to call her out of the room and to tell her that you put a hundred rubles in her pocket. But on my way, I went first to Madame Kobolatnikov's uh, to take them the general treatise on the positive method. And especially to recommend Pieterit's article and also Wagner's. And they come on here and what a state of things I find. Now could I, could I, have all these ideas and reflections if I had not seen you put the hundred ruble note in her pocket? When Lebeznikov finished his long-winded harangue with the logical deduction at the end, he was quite tired. Perspiration streamed from his, from his face. He could not, alas, even express himself correctly in Russian, though he knew no other language, so that he was quite exhausted, almost emaciated after his heroic exploit. But his speech produced a powerful effect. He had spoken with such vehemence, with such conviction, that everyone obviously believed him. Peter Petrovich felt that things were going badly with him. What is it to do with me if silly ideas did occur to you, he shouted. That's no evidence. You may have dreamt it, that's all. And I tell you, you're lying, sir. You're lying and slandering them, slandering for, from some spite against me. Simply from pique, because I did not agree with your free-thinking, godless social proposition. But this retort did not benefit Peter Petrovich. Murmurs of disapproval were heard on all sides. That's your line now, is it? cried Lebeznikov. That's nonsense. Call the police and I'll take my oath. There's only one thing I can't understand. What made him risk such a contentable action? What pitiful, despicable man. I can explain why he risked such an action, and if necessary, I too will swear to it, Raskolnikov said at last in a firm voice and a step forward. He appeared to be firm and composed. Everyone felt clearly from the very look of him that he really knew about it and that the mystery would be solved. Now I can explain it all to myself, said Raskolnikov, addressing Lebeznikov. From the very beginning of the business, I suspected that there was some scoundrelly intrigue at the bottom of it. I began to suspect it from some special circumstances known to me only, which I'll explain at once to everyone. They account for everything. Your valuable evidence has finally made everything clear to me. I beg all, all to listen. This gentleman, he pointed to Lujan, was recently engaged to be married to a young lady, my sister, Abdocha Romilovna Raskolnikov. But coming to Petersburg, he quarreled with me the day before yesterday at our first meeting, and I drove him out of my room. I have two witnesses to prove it. He's a very spiteful man. The day before yesterday, I did not know that he was staying here, in your room, and that consequently, on the very day we quarreled, the day before yesterday, he saw me give Katerina Ivanovna some money for the funeral, as a friend of the late Mr. Marmoladov. He at once wrote a note to my mother and informed her that I had given away all my money. Not to Katerina Ivanovna, but to Sofia Semyonovna. And referred in a most contemptible way to the character of Sofia Semyonovna that is hinted at the character of my attitude to Sofia Semyonovna. All this, you understand, was with the object of dividing me from my mother and sister by insinuating that I was squandering on unworthy objects the money which they had sent me and which all was all they had. Yesterday evening before my mother and sister had in his presence uh, oops sorry. Yesterday evening before my mother and sister and in his presence, I declared that I had given the money to Katerina Ivanovna for the funeral, and not to Sofia Semyonovna, and that I had no acquaintance with Sofia Semyonovna, and had never seen her before, indeed. At the same time, I added that he, Peter Petrovich Lujan, with all his virtues, was not worth Sofia Semyonovna's little finger, though he spoke so ill of her. To, to his question, would I let Sofia Semyonovna sit down beside my sister, I answered that I had already done so that day. Irritated that my mother and sister were unwilling to quarrel with me at his insinuations, he gradually began being unpardonably rude to them. The final rupture took place, and he was turned out of the house. All, his happen all this happened yesterday evening. Now I beg your special attention, consider. If he had now succeeded in proving that Sofia Semyonovna was a thief, he would have shown to my mother and sister that he was almost right in his suspicions, that he had reason to be angry at putting my sister on a level with Sofia Semyonovna, that in attacking me he was protecting and preserving the honor of my sister, his betrothed. In fact, he might even, through all this, have been able to estrange me from my family. No doubt he hoped to be restored to favor with them to say nothing of revenging himself on me personally. 
for he has grounds for supposing that the honor and happiness of Sofia Semyonovna are very precious to me. Yes, maybe he was able to put it together. That was what he was working for. That's how I understand it. That's the whole reason for it, and there can be no other. It was like this, or somewhat like this, that Raskolnikov wound up his speech, which was followed very attentively, though often interrupted by exclamations from his audience. But in spite of interruptions, he spoke clearly, calmly, exactly, firmly. His decisive voice, his tone of conviction, and his stern face made a great impression on everyone. Yes, yes, that's it, Lebeznikov assented gleefully. That must be it, for he asked me, as soon as Sofia Semyonovna came into our room, whether you were here, whether I had seen you among Katerina Ivanovna's guests. He called me aside to the window and asked me in secret. It was essential for him that you should be here. That's it, that's it. Lujan smiled contemptuously and did not speak, but he was very pale. He seemed to be deliberating on some means of escape. Perhaps he would have been able to give up everything and get away, but at the moment this was scarcely possible. It would have implied admitting the truth of the accusations brought against him. Moreover, the company, which had already been excited by drink, was now too much stirred to allow it. The commissary clerk, though indeed he had not gasped the whole, uh, grasped the whole position, was shouting louder than anyone and was making some suggestions very unpleasant to Lujan. But not all those present were drunk. Lodgers came in from all the rooms. The three Poles were tremendously excited and were continually shouting at him. The pan is a Lajdak, muttering threats in Polish. Hmm. Villain. Sonia had been listening with strained attention, though she too seemed unable to grasp it all. She seemed as though she had just returned to consciousness. She did not take her eyes off Raskolnikov, feeling that all her safety lay in him. Katerina Ivanovna breathed hard and painfully and seemed fearfully exhausted. Amelia Ivanovna stood looking more stupid than anyone, with her mouth wide open, unable to make out what had happened. She only saw that Peter Petrovich had somehow come to grief. Raskolnikov was attempting to speak again, but they did not let him. Everyone was crowding around Lujan with threats and shouts of abuse. But Peter Petrovich was not intimidated. Seeing that his accusation of Sonia had completely failed, he had recourse to insolence. Allow me, gentlemen, allow me. Don't squeeze, let me pass, he said, making his way through the crowd. No threats, if you please. I assure you will be useless, you will gain nothing by it. On the contrary, you'll have to answer, gentlemen, for violently obstructing the course of justice. The thief has been more than unmasked, and I shall prosecute. Our judges are not so blind and not so drunk, and will not believe the testimony of two notorious infidels, agitators and atheists, who accuse me from motives of personal revenge, which they are foolish enough to admit. Yes, allow me to pass. Don't let me find a trace of you in my room. Kindly leave at once. Everything is at an end between us. When I think of the trouble I've been taking, the way I've been expounding, all this fortnight, I told you myself today that I was going, when you tried to keep me, now I will simply add that you are a fool. I advise you to see a doctor for your brains and your short sight. Let me pass, gentlemen. He forced his way through, but the commissary clerk was unwilling to let him off so easily. He picked up a glass from the table, brandished it in the air, and flung it at Peter Petrovich. But the glass flew straight at Amelia Ivanovna. She screamed, and the clerk, overbalancing, fell heavily under the table. Peter Petrovich made his way to his room and half an hour later had left the house. Sonia, timid by nature, had felt before that day that she could be ill-treated more easily than anyone, and that she could be wrong with impunity. Yet, still, that, until that moment, she had fancied that she might escape misfortune by care, gentleness and submissiveness before everyone. Her disappointment was too great. She could, of course, bear with patience and almost without murmur anything, even this. For the first minute, she felt it too bitter. In spite of her triumph and her justica justification, and her first terror and stupefaction had passed, and she could understand it all clearly, the feeling of her helplessness and of wrong done to her made her heart throb with anguish, and she was overcome with hysteri hysterical weeping. 
At last, unable to bear any more, she rushed out of the room and ran home, almost immediately after Lucian's departure. But amidst the loud laughter in the glass flew at Amelia Ivanovna, it was more than the landlady could endure. With a shriek, she rushed like fury at Katerina Ivanovna, considering her to blame for everything. She's not the... Oh, God. <laughs> the low power. Yeah, she's not the one who threw the glass, <laughs> so... I think she was just looking for an excuse to attack. <laughs> like, they've been arguing, and then it's like... And then something, like, someone throws something at her, and she's like, you know what, that's it. <laughs> Out of my lodgings at once, quick march. With these words, she began snatching up everything she could lay her hands on that belonged to Katerina Ivanovna, throwing it on the floor. Katerina Ivanovna, pale, almost fainting, and gasping for breath, jumped up from the bed where she had sunk in exhaustion, and darted at Amelia Ivanovna. But the battle was too unequal. The landlady waved her away like a feather. Yeah, she's also incredibly sick. So that is always a factor. What is though that godless calumny was not enough? This foul creature attacks me. What? On the day of my husband's funeral, I'm turned out of my lodging. After eating my bread and salt, she turns me into the street with my orphans. Where am I to go? Well, the poor woman sobbing and gasping. Good God, she cried with flashing eyes, is there no justice upon earth? Whom should you protect, not us orphans? We shall see. There is law and justice on earth, there is, I'll find it. Wait a bit, godless creature. Polenka, stay with the children. I'll come back. Wait for me, if you have to wait in the street. We will see whether there is justice on earth. Throwing over her head that green shawl, which Marmeladov had mentioned to Raskolnikov, Katerina Ivanovna squeezed her way through the disorderly and drunken crowd of lodgers who still filled the room. Wailing and tearful, she ran into the street with a vague intention of going at once somewhere to find justice. Polenka, with the two little ones in her arms, crouched, terrified on the trunk in the corner of the room, where she waited, trembling for her mother to come back. Amelia Ivanovna raged about the room, shrieking, lamenting, and throwing everything she came across onto the floor. The lodgers talked incoherently. Some commented to the best of their ability. Uh, uh, sorry. The lodgers talked incoherently. Some commented to the best of their ability on what had happened. Others quarreled and swore at one another, while others struck up a song. Now it's time for me to go. Thoris Gonkov. He's like, yeah, this is a good time to leave. <laughs> well, Sofia Semyonovna, we shall see what you'll say now. He set off in the direction of Sonia's lodgings. He's like, now I got the girl. She saw me come to a rescue, and she's going to have feelings for me now. Maybe she will, because there is not a lot of people who have been kind to her <laughs> thus far. So maybe the one guy who even remotely makes an effort is going to be able to seal the deal. <laughs> Yeah, hers is a very sad story, for sure. Okay, so that was chapter three, Crime and Punishment. Thank you all for following the Russian Author series. I'll be back with Hearthstone Phoenix and Fallout 76, as I said, and then we will wrap up at the end of the day with our exercise series. Um... I'm probably going to be taking a break from streaming at least Wednesday and Thursday. In honor of Thanksgiving, I'll be traveling and spending time with my family, so expect there to be a hiatus in this show. I may be gone for a better part of the day on Friday too, and I don't know whether or not I'll be willing and able to stream when I get back. So if not, just assume that Wednesday through Saturday this week there will be no streams, but there should be uh, streaming going on tomorrow here on my platform, probably around the same time in the evening, and 
is um, Saturday, I think. Yeah. Alright, anyway, thanks for watching. And I'll be right back.